Probably the most adored aquatic animal in this state would have to be the West Indian manatee. They have gotten a lot of press lately because over 400 of them have died in just the last couple of months. The manatee is a herbivore, which means it only eats aquatic plants. In the wintertime, manatees swim up the St. John's River and spend the winter months in the warm waters of the freshwater springs. While there, they gorge themselves on plants like water hyacinth, hydrilla, and basically all of the aquatic plants. However, as everyone knows by now, the FWC has annihilated all the plants in the St. John's River. Last month during a large bass tournament held on the St. John's, all the anglers were complaining that they couldn't find any grass to fish in. There is a good reason why they couldn't find any grass, because there isn't any. Thanks to the FWC spray program, the manatees now have to eat terrestrial plants, like this one eating Spanish moss dangling from a cypress tree. Mark Roberts took this video in the St. John's River. Let's take a look at the nutrition value of Spanish moss. Spanish moss is not edible, well, barely inedible. The bottom of the growing tips, pictured above, provides about one-eighth of an inch of almost tasteless green. It probably takes 20 or 30 calories to get that little green tip, which probably provides less than a calorie of energy. Mark also caught these two manatees fighting over a terrestrial weed growing in another cypress tree. Manatees need 100 pounds of plants every day just to get enough nutrition to survive. They have to spend all day feeding just to get that amount. These terrestrial plants do not contain all the nutrients that they need. When manatees go into a saltwater environment, they have to rely on seagrasses for food. But unfortunately, they have been wiped out as well. So it is common to see manatees eating leaves off of mangrove trees. This one was in the Indian River, right where we see a lot of the manatee deaths. Not only do freshwater discharges kill seagrasses, but pesticides being applied to our lawns also kill them. This video was taken in Vero Beach, where they have very few freshwater discharges. There is, however, plenty of golf courses and lots of real green pretty yards. These manatees are on the sailfish flats near the St. Lucie Inlet where we do get lots of freshwater discharges from Lake Okeechobee. This group was trying to get to a patch of seagrass, but as you can see, it is all brown and dead. When they realize it, they turn and move on. What a shame. The same day I captured another manatee rooting around in the mud. This poor creature is trying to find a root, a piece of algae, or a tiny plant. Any of these would give this poor animal just a fraction of the nutrition that it needs. It finally gives up and moves on too. Manatees are routinely seen crawling up into people's yards to eat their grass. How much energy do you think it takes to get a thousand pound animal to crawl up this bank using its two tiny flippers? There is no way that they are getting enough energy from this grass. This poor mother has no choice though. It has a baby to feed. It has to wait for high tide so the baby can reach this grass. My brother shot this video, and he told me this manatee is here frequently, and sometimes the mother has to push the baby up the bank so it can reach the grass. This video makes me sick. It is too bad that it is more important for humans to have weed-free lawns and pretty green grass than it is to have healthy animals living in our waterways. Starvation isn't the only thing that manatees need to worry about. A study just released by the Center of Biological Diversity concludes that Florida manatees are chronically exposed to glyphosate because of the application of pesticides to sugarcane and aquatic weeds. Let's take a look at how sugarcane growers use glyphosate. Before the farmer plants his crops, he sprays and kills all of the weeds like you see here on the left side of this ditch. Notice the dead plants go right down to the water. I am going to show you how this tractor is going to spray the right side of this ditch. He turns the tractor around and sets up his spray machine. He is going to douse the grass growing on this access road. Watch as his spray goes straight into the drainage ditch. This is in the EAA, so these chemicals will eventually make their way to the Everglades. If there was only another way to keep grass from growing out of control, oh wait a minute. 
There is. It's called a friggin lawnmower and I believe they make them you can pull behind a tractor. Isn't it comforting to know that your food is being grown in this chemical saturated soil? Now you know why that most of our food tests positive for glyphosate. The study went on and found that the amount of glyphosate sprayed by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to control aquatic weeds in Lake Okeechobee exceeded the sample waters, reaching up to 10,000 kilograms per year, and that the Army Corps and Engineers Lake Okeechobee discharges result in high concentration of glyphosate in the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie Rivers. I live near the St. Lucie River, so thank you, FWC. And finally, the EPA recently determined that glyphosate's labeled uses are likely to adversely affect 93% of all listed species and 96% of all critical habitats, including the Florida manatee. So how long do you think it'll take for the EPA to finally ban this crap from being sprayed in our waters? Probably not soon enough. The FWC has lost all its credibility. The commissioners and the directors need to be replaced with people who care about our wildlife.